Where's the naked juggler? So good evening. We are really honored uh, to have you, Secretary Duncan, for Arnie, this. Arnie, not Secretary. Arnie, okay. <laughs> for this conversation. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time today talking about the future of learning, and we'd love to uh, have a conversation with you about human capital. And I asked a lot of people here and in preparation what word comes to mind when I say Arnie Duncan. And here are some of the things they said. Don't worry, it's not I'm gonna walk, walk out quick. <laughs> Tall. <laughs> Head of school, basketball fanatic, proud Chicagoan. Is that how you pronounce it? Chicagoan. Passionate about creating pathways for all students. Secretary of Education under Obama. So what people might not know about you is that you're doing really interesting work now in Chicago, specifically focused on addressing violence in communities, and with a special focus on black men age 17 to 24. You've been quoted as saying, I realized that my friends who went to college didn't end up shot or dead, while my friends who didn't go to college did. Can you help us make the connection between your work in education over the past seven years and your current work in Chicago trying to stem violence? Uh, sure, and to take this back a little, a little ways, um, grew up in, in Hyde Park, which is a middle class integrated part of Chicago. My dad taught at the University of Chicago for 40 plus years until he passed, and we grew up on that campus basically. And I was born in 64, and my sister in 67, my brother in 70, but in 61, my mother started an inner city tutoring program that was literally, it was, it was less than two miles from where we lived. We, we could actually walk, uh, walk, walk some days. But, um, 47th Street at that point was the dividing line between sort of middle class integrated Hyde Park and all black, all poor, pretty violent North Kenwood, Oakland. Her, her program was at 46th and Greenwood. And it was a formative experience for my sister and brother and I. Uh, my mother did that work for 52 years until her health gave out. And we all tried to follow in her footsteps in, in various ways. Um, growing up in her program, growing up starting to play basketball in the neighborhoods, um, losing friends when you're 13, 14, 15, that shapes you and honestly scars you in some ways, a little bit hard to talk about. Um, and some of these guys were guys that frankly protected me and kept me safe. And it was the dividing line. And you know, I think we're all here because we're passionate about education for a whole host of reasons. But in communities like that, the fork in the road is not just about education, which is important, it's not just about economic opportunity. Um, it is also sometimes life and death, and that's, that was unfortunately true. Um, fast forward to run the Chicago Public Schools for seven and a half years before going to D.C. Um, never enough progress, you always want to do more and go faster, but some things that I'm you know, really proud that we were able to do, and we've seen continued graduation rates continue to climb, and more students going to college. But during my seven and a half years leading Chicago Public Schools, on average we had a child killed every two weeks due to gun violence. Um, and that was by far the hardest part of my job and never got easier and in fact got harder and harder and going to those funerals and going to those kids' homes and going to classrooms where there's an empty desk and trying to make sense of the senseless was extraordinarily tough. And many of those families I got close to and still very, very close to now and some of those kids were killed 10, 11 years ago. Um, and a lot I missed about Chicago, I went to D.C. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the one thing I just totally, just in hindsight, extraordinarily naively, um, I thought violence couldn't get worse in Chicago. Like, I thought we were at the, at the rock bottom. Um, and the truth, and we can talk about why, for a whole host of reasons, things got a lot worse in Chicago. So just want, you know, a couple of stats that are just, Horrific. Uh, I talk about over seven years losing a child every two weeks due to gun violence. Last school year in Chicago, so last 
June, last September to June, 40 weeks, um, 59 kids were killed. And these are kids in school and um, over 360 shot. Um, there's one fantastic charter school that actually helped to start 20 years ago in North Lawndale, North Lawndale College Prep, where last school year alone, 17 kids were, were shot. So one high school, 17 kids shot. And you sort of think about what that's like. And I visited that school a couple months ago, and that was an unbelievable experience, talking to an auditorium full of kids and feeling that grief and pain and anger. Um, so it's a long way of saying, you know, coming back home, just wanting to help out and wanting to make a difference. Um, this is a crisis facing the city. And just to, for the national perspective, Chicago's the third largest city. New York and LA are larger. Chicago has more homicides than New York and LA combined. Um, we had 760 last year, almost 4,000 shot. For us to just, in a perfect world, we would get to zero. Um, it's probably a little unrealistic just to be normal, just to be average and be in line relative to the population of New York and LA, um, we'd have to go from 762 to 150. So we'd have to have a 600 reduction in body count, about an 80% cut. So we could cut it in half and still be double what other cities are. So we are that abnormal. We are that far from where we should be. Um, so just trying to work directly with the guys who are most likely to shoot or be shot. Um, unfortunately, that is 80% of those shooter, shooting or being shot are young black men, 17, 24, and that's where we're concentrating. There are 15 neighborhoods in Chicago that are producing the vast majority of violence, south and west side, so that's where we're focused. Well, I've heard you say that you, despite these grim statistics, that you're, you remain hopeful, and that when you talk one-on-one -on -one with these young men, you see citizens, productive citizens. You see men who have made a, quote, rational choice, even though that choice is violent and you wanted to work to give them a, an option for a different rational choice. You know, it, it's fascinating and uh, unbelievably humbling work. And <laughs> we make, we're making big mistakes every day and learning from them, but we started a little over a year ago with one cohort of guys. Cohort for us is 20 or 30 guys, and we try and build a brotherhood and camaraderie and bring guys who are actually shooting at each other together and work mm -hmm. through that stuff, because all this stuff is so proximate. It's very, very tight in neighborhoods. So we now have six cohorts of guys going three south side, three west side, and um, every guy's story is different, um, but many, not all, many at about the age of 12 or 13 became the men of their homes. And mom was on crack or an alcoholic, um, dad was locked up or gone, and they had to make some money. Mm. And all of us in rooms like this are absent from their lives. We're not present. And there's one guy who's present, and that's the guy in the street corner. And so they go get a job. That guy's always hiring. And that inevitably leads towards a life of selling drugs and the violence associated with it. So um, I'm, I, I don't judge anymore. <laughs> um, I have a younger sister and brother. Obviously, I had none of those challenges. But if I had to fend for them, I can't say I would have made a radically different choice. Mm -hmm. um, my youngest guy said, uh, guy who started selling drugs the earliest, said he started selling at nine years old. Mm -hmm. And he said, Arnie, that was really hard to do. And I'm like, I bet it was. And he asked another guy, you know, why, you know, why did you go do that? He said, I just got tired of hearing my mother cry at night. You know, I had to go do what I had to go do. And so people say sometimes, oh, it's great you're giving them a second chance. I always say, I don't think we're necessarily giving a second chance, but I think we're often giving a first chance. Mm -hmm. They never had a first chance. And they made a rational choice at 9 or 11 or 13 or 14, and they're making a second very rational choice at 17, 18, 22, 24 to make some money in the legal economy. And we work through lots of trauma and social emotional issues and counseling guys who get into high school diplomas and transition them from the street economy to the legal economy. But these are amazing leaders. They are survivors. They have a resilience. A lot of us in this room can't begin to match. Um, we talk about post-traumatic. A lot of these guys have lived with trauma from the day they were born. Somehow they've survived. And they are going to, I'm 100% convinced, lead our city where we need to go. Um, last thing I'll say is, you know, people ask, how do you find them? Um, we've had a waiting list for every cohort of guys. There's a no, waiting list. There's no shortage of guys right. looking to get out of the life. Mm -hmm. It is so dangerous. It's so violent. They're getting shot at. The police are chasing them. And no one's getting rich on the streets. Yeah. No one's making any money. And um, we're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour, and that's, um, that's more than enough. So call it $25, $30,000 a year. You know, jail sales is 55 or 60. Every homicide costs the city 1.3 million, 1.4 million. So I can make a pretty good ROI yeah, case right. that this is the, For the, the right, right thing yeah. to do. Well, you're speaking to a group of ed tech entrepreneurs, 
uh, people from traditional education industries, publishing. You're talking to people who are financing educational reform. You're talking to charter management, organization leaders. What advice do you have for us as we think about the role technology could play in education as you think about the trauma that many of the kids whom we serve come into school with that maybe we're not so proximate to? Yeah, I think there are a couple different pieces to that. It's a really thoughtful question. Um, first is, is we think about sort of you know, individual learning plans, the personalized learning. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of that. I think we all are. This idea of sort of a personalized social and emotional plan and how do we help meet kids where they are. And I would say, you know, if kids are hungry, it's hard to learn. If they are living in fear, it's hard to learn. Um, one of the guys on my staff who was a, was a former gang leader, created lots of violence in the community, he's been shot six times. And, yeah. But um, he saw his, you know, he, he found his mother dead who was killed by his stepfather. And, he's, you know, he said, there's no, no one reached out to me. So he had all this rage and he went out and inflicted as much pain on the community as he could. And so if we're not walking with these young men and women, if we don't move outside our comfort zones, then we're just talking a foreign language. We're not even in the game. And so um, the other thing I'll say is I always say, you know, I think technology can be a great equalizer. It can also exacerbate the divide yeah. between the haves and the have-nots. So if we're not thinking deeply and seriously about equity, if we're not thinking deeply and seriously about race, we're actually exacerbating the divide in our country, which scares the heck out of me, because that divide now is, as you know, people here know, you know, you know globally, globally competitive, knowledge-based economy, those without are just going to, it's, we're, we're moving towards a caste system. Yeah. And um, if we are perpetuating that or exacerbating that, then we're actually hurting, not just hurting kids, but hurting our democracy. So in May of 2017, the, um, U.S. Government Accountability Office investigators found that between the year 2000 and 2014, both the percentage of K-12 public schools in high poverty and the percentage comprised of mostly African-American or Hispanic students grew significantly, more than doubling from seven to 15,000 schools. And the percentage of all schools with so-called racial or socioeconomic isolation grew from 9% to over 16%. What's more, such schools, investigators found, offered disproportionately fewer math, science, and college prep courses, and had higher rates of students who were held back in ninth grade, suspended, or expelled. Do you believe that the average American understands the connection between strengthening our democracy, which you just referenced, by creating healthy and sustainable communities and the school and life success of, ki of kids who don't look like their own kids. Yeah, well, I can't speak for the country. I'll speak for myself. And a lot of the data came from our Office of Civil Rights that did yeah. this massive data collection. And you know, you think you know some of this stuff. But I remember a couple years ago we, we found, and I had no clue, and we announced with Eric Holder that um, across the country, the vast majority of pre-K kids who are being suspended and expelled, which I didn't know we were suspending and expelling three four year olds. Pre-K, I mean, wow. it's not, you can laugh, it's really cry. They were young boys of color, black and brown boys. And you talk about a punch to the gut. I mean, I was stunned. Wow. Again, I'm, this is my life's work and I had no clue. So people don't like when I talk about the school or prison pipeline, but it is real in the fact that it actually starts with three and four year olds. And not that three and four year olds don't come to pre-K with some very real challenges, because I know they do, but is the answer to kick them out and put them back to wherever the harm or damage is being done to them, or is the answer to figure out with a social worker or a counselor what's going on and what supports we can, we can provide for them. So, you know, again, we in the education, we in the education space sometimes, you know, you know, found the enemy and it was us. You gotta look in the mirror, and that, that's us. Mm. And we gotta own that, and so whether it's, segregation, whether it's massive disparities in access to AP classes, STEM classes, um, we are so, you know, again, education, just like technology, education can and should be a great equalizer, mm -hmm. but it is fundamentally not equal. It is fundamentally unfair. I mean, our, not to, you know, our K-12 system is based upon property taxes. Mm -hmm. Property taxes favors the wealthy. There's not a national play here. 
when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, we got less than half the money per year for my kids who were 85% live below the poverty line, 90% students of color. We had less than half the money each year of kids that lived five or six miles north of us in you know, Winneka and Wilmette. We sued the state. We lost. The state recently made some changes. But the massive inequities in virtually every state in the nation exacerbates these divides. So what do we do about this inequity? You know, we have kind of, we're kind of Sybil. We're like Sybil. We say that we live in a post-racial environment because we had a black president. And then you read Ta-Nehisi Coates, the first white president. We tell ourselves that the access to technology is becoming ubiquitous. Yet we know, I was just talking to a, a, a leader at a CMO who said that they had to wait three months in LA to get Wi-Fi. So we pride ourselves in this room in being data-driven and being so aware of the data and the facts, yet we can't even come to agreement on matters of equity or matters of, of access. And I was humbled. I'm a graduate of the University of Virginia. And I was stunned when I saw what happened in Charlottesville, when I saw um, white supremacists show up, not even thinking that they had to wear a hood. So I'm wondering, do you believe that we're in a different place because of some of the, some of the, trying not to be, uh, yeah. When I hear, when I say I can't breathe, everybody conjures an image here. Are we where we are now because we fundamentally do not value black and brown lives as much as we value white lives? Um, absolutely, it's a short answer. And let me just go right back to Chicago real quick. And one stat I didn't give you of talk about homicides, you talked about shootings. So in 2017, if you commit murder in Chicago, there's about a 13% chance you get caught. So 87% of homicides go unsolved. It's something called a clear rate that I'm obsessed on. Um, if you shoot somebody but don't murder them, that's about a 2 to 3% clear rate. So there, there are no consequences. And the vast majority of people, young people being shot in Chicago look more like you than like me. Mm -hmm. um, I promise you, if those 762 murders were people of my skin color, not yours, that our clear rate would be higher. So uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we don't value black and brown lives as much as we li value lives of folks that, that uh, look like me. Um, again, if you look at funding, edu educational funding inequities, if you look at lack of access, whether it's to preschool or to AP classes, um, it, it is not all based on, it's not all, I don't want to oversimplify, it's rural, white, poor, mm -hmm. too. Appalachian, right. I spent Absolutely. time in a place like Carrollton, Georgia, mm -hmm. that were as tough as any of my mm -hmm. south and west sides neighborhoods, sometimes tougher. But we value different lives differently. And I think the challenge in um, rooms like this, that by definition, you're not in Salt Lake City at the St. Regis without some <laughs> breaks along the way, a lot of hard work, but some, some breaks, some privilege, is do we care about our neighbor's kids as much as we care about our own? And I think as a nation, we all care passionately about our own kids. We don't care enough about our neighbor's kids, whether they be black or Latino or poor or whatever it might be, or rural white. And until we, like your original, you know, until we value human capital everywhere, until we see genius in every community and every neighborhood, um, I always say talent's a lot more evenly spread than opportunity. Until mm -hmm. opportunity meets that talent fully, um, we're not there. I'll go, not to further complicate, not to go off a tangent, but um, when my kids were being shot in Chicago, I thought it was because we didn't value black and brown kids. Mm. And I thought, I hate to say this, I thought it would take white kids being killed to see something happen around gun control. And then we had the Sandy Hook massacre, Newtown, yeah. Connecticut, which saw 20 white babies and five teachers and a principal killed, and that was the hardest day of my time in D.C. and mm -hmm. President said probably the hardest day of his life, his, his presidency, mm -hmm. and he dealt with the hardest issues on the planet. And the fact that we got zero done, zero, we got an F in terms of gun control past that, blows me away. Obviously, we're coming off of you know Las Vegas, which is the most right. horrific shooting in our nation's history. So, 
it's a long way of saying we definitely under we value black and brown lives less than white lives. It's unquestionable to me. But I don't think we, I know, we don't value many people's lives yeah. as much as other countries. Not to go on too, too long. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is from Australia. They had a massacre yeah. from her home state of Tasmania, Port Arthur, in 1996. Mm -hmm. They changed gun laws right after that. It was actually a conservative government mm -hmm. did it. And there hasn't been one mass shooting in 20 years like in that. Australia, not one. That's the gift that Australia gave to its kids. We average a mass shooting every day in our country. So we don't value our lives um, in ways that other countries do. Last example, pre-K. Pre-K is ubiquitous in many countries. Mm -hmm. I was in the Netherlands last summer. Every four-year-old has access, and they're moving to every three-year-old. Yeah. And when I talked about millions of kids here not having access, they honestly sort of thought I was lying. They really couldn't, they couldn't comprehend. And they finally said, why don't Americans value your children? And I didn't have a good answer. So there are lots of, you know, this is, this is complicated. It's multi-layered. Race is a huge part of it, but it's mm -hmm. deeper than race. So the Gates Foundation just uh, announced uh, almost $2 billion investment in K-12 through schools. And we've been spending a lot of time today talking about the alignment and relevance of learning to careers. And I'm wondering if you have a, if you could share a point of view about whether or not the purpose of education is to prepare kids for industry or if there's something else? I think there are lots of purposes. <laughs> so I've, part of my passion for education has always been in my mind, just growing up as part of my mother's program, that kids who got an education, who she was able to get to college, they were able to break the cycle of poverty mm -hmm. in one generation. Like they were able to go from not having any money to raising families with some stability. So that part of, again, there may be other ways to break cycles of poverty, but I don't know how you do that without education. Like mm -hmm. that for me is a fundamental building block. So that one is hugely important to me. Um, I do think particularly now, and it's not new, but I think it's sort of come to the service, you know, in, in part reaction to a black president, frankly, and in part reaction to the current president, is our democracy is fraying on the edges. Mm. And I, I would love to have many more families of color and white families be economically secure and have good jobs. Mm -hmm. I would love to spend time in McDowell County, West Virginia, and despite you know, Cole's not coming back, and what are we doing for those? Right. And no one, Republican or Democrat, has come with you know, how are we retraining mm -hmm. there? And we all have to own that collective, you know, that collective failure. Um, but we have to find ways to knit our democracy back together. I think education, K-12, higher ed, has a unique opportunity to do that. Um, it's fascinating. We had White House, we, we did polls. If you, put, if you put people who are center left to far left together in a room, they all tend to go further left. If you put <laughs> folks who are center right and far right in a room together, they all go far right. That's interesting. And our middle is collapsing. Mm. And our ability to compromise is, is uh, it's getting tougher. And I think democracy is a fantastic institution if you're willing to compromise. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to compromise, democracy breaks down. And our middle's collapsing. Mm -hmm. So it's a long way of answering, can you in education get people from communities, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, urban, rural, can you mix them? Virtually, technology, can we start to see our common humanity? And the goal not being to convert people to our way of thinking, but just to build some trust, to build some understanding, mm -hmm. to build some empathy. And so I think education has a critical role to play now, maybe more than ever, mm -hmm. in helping people get outside their skins, move in uncomfortable spaces, start to build relationships and trust with people who look different, believe different, live different. And if we don't do that K-12, if we don't do it in higher ed, once we become adults, we all self-segregate. We all go to our yeah. collective corners. It's almost too late. So I think there's a unique opportunity and desperate need for education to find ways to, to build those bridges and build those divides, or yeah. bridge, bridge those divides. You know, when I was a little girl, I was um, introduced to the metaphor of America as a melting pot. And as a 50-something, yes, I said it, uh, woman, <laughs> I see it I'm more. I'm something. So. <laughs> I see it more as a quilt, where it's a quilt that has different fabrics and different colors and different textures, all required to make that quilt. When it comes together, when it's woven together, 
something that gives warmth and comfort. And I think we've moved away from celebrating difference and what it could do for us to try and meld everybody into some amalgam that doesn't mean anything to anyone. And as I think about the hypersegregation that is happening in charter schools, in public schools, in private schools, I'm wondering how we're going to appreciate the different textures and the different colors and even have an instinct to weave it all together. Yeah. So I'm a big fan. I mean, not easy. You know, Skype is great for kids. There are all kinds of ways to build bridges, you know, across the United States, across the globe. I'm a huge believer in sort of service and community service and mm -hmm. having kids from the youngest ages, you know, serve and to do that together. And a little less about singing Kumbaya, but more about can we paint a school together? Can we clean up a neighborhood together? Can we help to build a house together? And when people do those kinds of things, it cuts through lots of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, I would love to see on a voluntary basis a year of national service. You know, make mm -hmm. that again, mm -hmm. make that an opportunity for everybody. And and I want to see more. You know, disadvantaged kids be the doers of service, not the recipients of mm -hmm. service. And I think it's just a healthy part mm -hmm. of growing up is contributing to your community and mm -hmm. traditionally it's the private school kids tutoring the yeah. you know public school kids and that, that's cool we need that but public school kids can tutor other public school kids and they can work together on a you know community project and so again I think schools have a unique opportunity if they're willing to go some other place and do some things they get want proximate. get proximate <laughs> and I I mean, just one right, just right now in Chicago, it's interesting, one, uh, fantastic, it's actually a faith-based school. Mm -hmm. A buddy of mine runs on the west side where there's a lot of violence, and their last two games have been canceled because the teams from the suburbs wouldn't come in and play them. They, you know, they, they feared for their safety, and you sort of get it, but mm -hmm. nothing's going to happen on a football field. Mm -hmm. And what they don't understand is these kids are living with this level of fear every single day. Mm -hmm. They can't escape mm -hmm. it. So for you not to be willing to get on a bus and play a football game and go back to your mm -hmm. safety and comfort. Yep. You're not willing to be, you know, how does that make those kids feel that these guys are too scared to come right. to a neighborhood and play? Dignity. So there's an, a massive opportunity to build a bridge there or to further stigmatize and demonize and alienate. De and, alienate mm -hmm. and again, have them understand how separate and how different they are. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a massive missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to turn our attention to higher ed a little bit, if I might. And we received some questions from you all, and I'd like to share a couple of those. Um, here's the first. The, Ob the Obama administration oversaw the largest expansion of federal lending to higher education, with over one million students defaulting on student loans each year, and the staggering fiscal and opportunity cost for the federal loan program growing each year. What would you have done differently do you think the U.S. government has replaced mortgage companies as predatory lenders? And if so, what should the policy shift be to fix the problem? So lending increased, uh, but also so did grants. We had an additional $40 billion for Pell Grants, which I'm pretty proud of, without going back to taxpayers for nickel. Mm -hmm. Went from 6 million Pell recipients to 9, nine million. Um, the, the biggest, uh, lots, again, lots of things I'm proud of, lots of failures, lots of things we didn't get done. For me, the biggest challenge in higher ed is all of us as taxpayers, we contribute and always test people, everyone always thinks I'm lying, we contribute $175 billion each year in grants and loans. It's a huge, it's a massive investment. And it's all based upon inputs. None of it's based upon outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's all based upon enrollment. And we have you know, 7,000 institutions of higher education. Some are amazing, some are horrific. Some graduate, uh, almost every student coming in with a Pell Grant, some graduate students in the single digits. Mm -hmm. And for me, I worry less about the loan than I do about whether you get that diploma. If you get that degree, pretty good odds you're going to, I'll come back, there's one caveat there, but you're probably going to be in good shape. It's when you have the loan and no paper to show for it yeah. that you're in a worse financial position than when you started. So we tried and pushed back, honestly, some, both from the left and from the right, but for that massive investment, so I'd, to be clear, I'd love to see a lot more money go to universities where it's not just about access, but it's around completion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not around exclusion, it's around inclusion. And to drive accountability. To, to, to just because mm -hmm. the goal is not to go to college, yeah. the goal is to graduate. Yeah. I think most people in this room, you know, they, went to, they graduated from college. And some universities have shown no interest, no creativity, no sense of urgency, no passion for improving completion rates. Why are we funding them? And you're seeing more and more charter networks and others start to steer kids towards certain schools and away from others. Mm -hmm. 
I'll be very honest, when I ran Chicago Public Schools, we got a lot of colleges in Chicago. Some are fantastic, some are horrific. Yeah. And we started very intentionally telling kids, not that we would prohibit you from going here, but we really don't think you need to go to this school. Mm -hmm. Because kids that look like you don't come out the back end. Mm -hmm. And so districts can do it, charter networks can do it. You gotta build your, you know, build your database. It's not that hard to, to figure that out. But we as taxpayers should demand, I think, that more money go to universities that are helping young people mm -hmm. complete, and less money should go to places that aren't serious about it. And until we talk in education generally about outcomes, <laughs> higher ed, K-12, to early childhood as well, um, we're feeding the beast. We're not actually getting things better. So that's, mm -hmm. that's my biggest regret, that we, we, we were able to shift almost no, we did some creative stuff, but it's on the margins. In terms of the massive public investment, it was all based upon inputs when we came in, and it's still all based upon inputs today. Do you think that College for All is a, is a, um, is a bad goal, is a misguided, is yeah. the word I was searching for, a goal? So all these things in education, I'm always, it's, for me the debates are so dysfunctional, I'm always a both and guy. So it's charters or traditional schools. Right. I just want more good schools. Right. I don't care what they look like, what their name is. I, so I want more good charter schools. I want more good traditional schools. I want less bad charters. I want less bad traditional schools. Um, I think the goal of having every kid learning beyond high school, yes, we have to have that. How many of us are getting good jobs with a high school diploma today? Almost nobody. Right. If you drop out, you're basically condemned to poverty and social failure. Now, what does that learning look like? It could be a four-year university, it could be a two-year community college, it could be trade, technical, vocational training, it could be national service, it could be military service, but some form of learning, some form of education beyond high school um, has to be the goal. Um, I'll take the blame or the credit that Chicago's the first city, and I pushed the mayor on this, to say that every high school graduate has to have a post-secondary plan. Mm. And, you know, it's one thing to mandate, it's another to make it real. <laughs> But just to say we're graduating students from high school and they're going to be fine in the world, we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves. Again, we're part of the problem. And final thing I'll say is that I don't think we should ever track kids. Like in Germany, some other countries, they have great vocational yep. programs, China, but like at 13, you were told you're going to vocational route or you're going to higher ed route. I don't want to do that. I just want to give kids multiple great options and let them figure out their passion. Let them mm -hmm. figure out which way they want to go. That's not for anyone else to decide. But if every young person had you know, a couple, two, three great options and figure out what's the best fit for them at this, as an 18-year-old, that would be huge. That would be huge. Um, does it have to be all before year? Of course not. So do you think that we're using the right rubrics to evaluate the um, effectiveness of higher education institutions? We don't evaluate their effectiveness. There, there are no rubrics. So you saw the, the recent debate with WGU. Yeah, no, so I, again, I, so we can go through, that's accreditation, yep. accreditation is broken, we can talk about that, but again, you look at US News and World Report that drives so much right. of this, and a huge percent of that is based upon what percent of kids you exclude, right. not what percent you include. Mm -hmm. So you gain prestige, you gain status by not opening your door. And finding ways, again, on campus, finding ways Virtually, with technology, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of what Arizona State is doing. Mm -hmm. Southern New Hampshire, I'm a huge fan of. They're reaching lots of populations that yeah. will never step foot on their yeah. campus, but they are reducing exclu exclusivity and increasing inclusivity. And the goal is not just to be more inclusive, the goal is to have those young people graduate, mm -hmm. complete. Um, so whether it's accreditation, which is absolutely antiquated and doesn't yeah. make any sense, well, it's, for me, you always got to follow the money. Whether it's our $175 billion, it just goes wherever kids go, regardless yeah. of outputs. Um, we, we, we are not serious about accountability and metrics at the higher ed side. I want to talk about broken promises. And, and let me sorry, just yeah, I always want to be clear, because sometimes people are, like for me, the goal is not just graduation rates, because one way to increase your graduation rates is to work with more privileged kids, more yeah. advantaged kids. Right. It's what are you doing to, you know, Franklin and Marshall in the past couple years has tripled the number of Pell recipients they are serving. Franklin and Marshall's Pell recipients are actually graduating at slightly higher rights than the traditional student body. That's a stunning stat. It is. 
So for me, it's, again, not just absolute, but who are you serving? Are you increasing first-gen college? Are you increasing minority? Are you increasing mm -hmm. Pell Grant, English language learners? And then not just increasing their access, but increasing their completion rates. Mm -hmm. So Arizona State has seen all of their completion rates go up, but they will tell you their Native American, while much higher than most, is still nowhere near as high as it should. And they have to continue to work on closing that equity gap. Um, so for me, it's always not absolute. It's what progress are you making? And what's the degree of challenge you're taking mm -hmm. on? Uh, what are you willing to take on? At the reception a few moments ago, someone stopped me and said that the country that they were from invested 1% of GDP into public education. And uh, I remember when I lived in California that one of the promises that we made is that if students, high school students, maintained a certain GPA, they would be guaranteed access to yeah. a state university. And that has broken down as more international students come to our institutes of higher education paying full fare mm. because the pressure is on, the financial pressure is on. Mm. What do you think is going to happen in 25 years? <laughs> I wish I knew, boy. Uh, hope we don't have nuclear war in the next couple of years. Yeah, right. Uh, wanna, <laughs> you know, I said I wasn't going to talk about that, mm -hmm. but... Uh, if you always ask about education policy, I would love right. to just be focused on education right. policy. That's right. the least of my worries these yeah. days. Um, it, it's a lot at stake. And again, this, this audience understands this better than most, that the world is changing so fast. And our ability to create opportunity at scale with the speed at which we need to for the communities that are underserved and locked out I'm not sure we're winning that race. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think we're probably not winning that race. And so again, for all the innovators here, for all the creators, it's what are we doing for you know, our public school students who are now across the country majority minority? Right. You know, what are we doing for our public school students who now the majority are getting free lunches every yes. day because their families can't afford them? And if your innovation is helping just at the top end, then that's not leading our country where we mm -hmm. need to go. So I always am optimist. I'm hopeful. I think there are folks in this room and folks in classrooms, amazing teachers, principals around the country who are solving this every single day. Um, what I worry about most, I think, is our lack of national ambition yes. here. And we, we don't I always say there's no one has left or right. Edu education can be totally bipartisan, nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. No one has monopoly and good ideas. But we should, as a nation, agree on some goals. So for me, there are a couple basic goals. I would love us to lead the world in access to high-quality pre-K. Mm -hmm. um, we got high school graduation rates to 84%. That was improvement. That's mm -hmm. a historic high, but it obviously a hell of a long way to go. The goal of the current administration should be to get that to 90%. Mm -hmm. I would love to have 100% of that 90% college and career ready. And I think we should try and lead the world in college completion rates. Right now we're 12. And we can have lots of honest and vigorous debate about the best strategies to achieve those mm -hmm. goals. But as a nation, we should lock in to those goals. But you don't hear anyone talking about those. And absent that, other nations that, again, left, right, liberal, conservative, doesn't matter, that have education ambition, that have education vision, that have an education dream for where they want to go, who see human capital as their greatest resource, not material wealth, or not oil, or not coal, or not whatever, but the human capital. Um, that for me is what's lacking. And if, so until we get there, I think we're going to continue to play what I call small ball and mm -hmm. debate stuff that I don't want to say is irrelevant, but is just absolutely on the margins. It's like scoring political points around ideology. It's not about how do we get to 90% high school completion? Mm -hmm. How do we lead the world in college completion? And if those are the wrong goals, I'm happy to have that debate. Maybe someone has better goals, mm -hmm. but I think that's a, those are pretty fair, honest places to start. And nothing of what I just said, I think, is. Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. So it's not lost on me that you went from macro federal policy to a very intimate, I think, one-on-one -on -one experience with these young men in Chicago. What do you prefer? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a deep question. Uh, <laughs> um, man, uh, I think this is how I grew up, so this is very much going back to my roots of tutoring and being t tutored in my mother's program. So this is where I am, strange as it sounds, most comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but I totally miss the access and the ability to move things on a national level. And I think 
those of us who care passionately about policy need to be proximate and need to be in community and need mm -hmm. to be grounded in reality and rooted, rooted in community. Um, but I want to be able to walk in both worlds, you know, the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, DC try obviously DC. You're playing macro, but I visited hundreds and hundreds of schools yeah. and was, you know, 50 states and Definitely. Native American reservations mm -hmm. and things I had no clue about to stretch myself and move outside my comfort zone. So even when you're playing at that level, you got to play as much as you can in community in the streets. And now that I'm in the streets in the community, you got to find ways to uh, try and influence, you know, policy at, the, at, a, at a broader scale. Mm -hmm. So it's not either or. It's 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 again. It's, for me, it's always both and. And mm -hmm. hopefully, one makes you better at the other. It makes you right. a little bit smarter. So I think we're getting the cut it off, Jesse, because I could mm -hmm. I could talk with you for a long She's time. She's the boss. She's yeah. the boss, though. So. Um, so please, everyone, please join me in thanking Secretary Johnson. So Carrie asked me to read something here, which I have to find, about the bar activities. <laughs> Oops. Um, where is it? Oh, Carrie's going to kill me. I think it's something about we're satisfying Michael Moe's second passion. Karaoke night at yes. the hotel after dinner. Yes. Uh, there, are actually, there are prizes. There's both uh, karaoke and bowling. And uh, there are robot prizes. Um, and, uh, so Here it is. It's uh, GSV is reserved Daly's Pub at the Montage for karaoke, bowling. Yes, they have four lanes. And some great prizes from Wonder Workshop for ace bowlers and singers. Uh, great. Thank you, guys. Don't stop believing. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you. He's so great. Chicago, he's such 